Hey, this is John Henney, and on this episode of Why I Love This Vocal, Alanis Morissette and You Want to Know, coming up next. In case you don't know who I am, I'm a voice teacher in Los Angeles, and I've also trained hundreds of other voice teachers, some of them quite successful. So in this series, I want to give you my perspective as a voice teacher as to what I consider really essential vocals. So today, Alanis Morissette and You Ought to Know, this, this was an interesting um, song. I remember when this came out. Um, no one had heard of Alanis Morissette beyond her native Canada. And so when this song came out, she was an unknown and she was competing in the charts at the time with, with people like, you know, Mariah Carey and Sheryl Crow or Seal. And so as, as any breakthrough artist, debuting artist, it's really, really hard to get the airplay and to get the attention and breakthrough. And there was a station here in Los Angeles, that, this album came out in 95, uh, called uh, K-Rock. And they tended to be an alternative rock station. And they picked up on this first single, You Ought to Know. And I, I remember this song just grabbing everybody by the throat and propelling this album to uh, one of the best-selling albums, uh, certainly of the 90s. Um, it won a number of Grammy Awards. I think at the time she was the youngest person to win uh, album of the year or something like that. It was, it was really, really a remarkable, explosive uh, album. And this single started it all. And what I find really, really remarkable is actually how the song starts. Um, you don't get much. Let's, let's listen. I want you to know that I'm happy for you. Now, what really strikes me is there's no intro. Uh, it starts right with her singing, and all you hear is drums and uh, and a little bit of a of a pad, uh, but but the, the that's just way in the background. And it's it's not just drums. It's drums played with with brushes, which is more typical in jazz music. You don't hear that often in pop music. So right off the the top, um, the song was a little different. And the other thing is her vocal. Uh, now, she starts off with this nice little positive sentiment. I want you to know that I'm happy for you. And there's something about this song that you know she's not happy for this person. And what I love is in the sparse uh, beginning of this song, she keeps her vocal deliberately sparse. Uh, she's not singing legato. She's not going, I want you to know. It's very disconnected. I want you to know. So there's, there's space between the words. She's kind of breathy. She is making an emotional connection already that you know this song's going somewhere. This is, this is not a typical, hey, I'm happy for you kind of love song. This is going to have a, a different approach. And she establishes that instantly with the vocal. The thing that I love most about this vocal and what I'm going to delve into is in, in uh, my, my first couple of episodes, I delved maybe into, into rhythm and, and vocal sounds, but this song is emotional connection. And the, the vocal technique really takes a back seat to her um, emotion and her grabbing the audience with that emotion. And I just think that's wonderful. Of, of the levels of singing, uh, you have the, the technical level, which I work on people with, and then you have the musician level that she does quite well here, being a good musician, and then you have the emotional connection, which to me is the highest level of singing. And that's why this song was such a huge hit. Um, now let's listen to it again, back with, with the music. And so again, it's this very, very sparse musical bed. I want you to know that I'm So instantly, the song changes. 
And what you have here is you, you have um, Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers and Dave Navarro, who happened to be in the Red Hot Chili Peppers at uh, the time. And man, Flea is just so cool here when the bass comes. So you get this really, really driving rhythm. And what Alanis does is she steps up to meet that. She actually sets it. She, she sings now with a little more intensity and a little more rhythmic accuracy. Because um, the first part was kind of lazy. I want you. And now, an older version of me. She gets right into it. And she starts to not only sing with more intensity, she starts to put a little more drive on the consonants and, and almost begins to spit the words, uh, if you will, in a way, which is, again, using her musicality to connect emotionally because this is telegraphing to the listener, she's pissed off. I know the version of me Is she perverted like me? Would she go shoot on you in a theater? And that, that's uh, edited there for, for language and suggestive. But um, I, I know there's the PG-13 version, but, but in, in the, the actual lyric, uh, when she uh, uses suggestive comments or profanity, man, she spits it out in such a way that, that it, it really is compelling. Does she speak eloquently? And would she have your baby? And what she said, and would she have your baby? Like she's really like like popping those those consonants and, and really laying into it. She is connecting with the rhythm that the whole band is playing. Let me take this back and I will show you what's going on uh, in the whole arrangement. I know the version of me. Is she perverted like me? Would she go down on you in a theater? Does she speak eloquently? And would she have your baby? Or shall she make a really excellent mother? I mean, she's just right in there like one of the musicians, just popping those rhythms. So she raises the intensity level as well. The next thing she does here, I really dig. There's a little bit of a production trick in that they're going to double her vocal, but now the rhythm as, as it moves from being kind of this popping ba 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 to this running da 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 And she does this wonderfully. Um. Cause the love that you gave that we made wasn't able to make it enough for you to be open wide. No. And every time you speak her name, does she know how you told me it hold me until you died? Now the other thing she's doing here in terms of vocal technique is all the vowels now. She, she starts off very, I want you to know. And then she's an older version of me. She starts to sing it, but now, and the love that you gave, everything starts to get very wide. It starts to get brighter. It's, it's, it, it, it has a, a um, almost like a more punk kind of feel. Um, and this was also a big alternative uh, rock hit. Uh, but, but that, this, the, the double vocal along with the wider, brighter, almost nastier vowel sound, again, increases the musical ten uh, tension and the emotional intensity. Let's go back. Listen to that uh, with the whole band. I know the version of me. Cause the love that you gave that we made wasn't able to make it up for you to be open wide. And you notice the mix itself is brighter here. Um, the, the guitar, all of a sudden the guitar kicks in, that's brighter, and she goes brighter as well. She's really in sync with with the musical bed, which which lifts up um, uh, the emotion. It all works together. And the technique, she's, she's not singing with this, this perfect technique. She doesn't want to. That's not the emotional context of the song. No. And 
I mean, you can hear her, she's reverse phonating when she breathes in, <gasps> which you're not supposed to do, right? She's making all this sound and just, uh, just the ends of the words. Now she's adding uh, extra oomph at the end of these words, an extra push. And every time you speak her name, to remind you of the mess you left when you went away. Yeah, went away. And I know later in, in the 90s that, that kind of got overused. And, and again, she does this other... It's not fair to deny me of the cross I bear that you Here. gave to me. You, you, you ought to know. I mean, that vocal's really raw. And she does that, that flip at the end. But, but on the third one, she kind of goes for it and doesn't quite make it. And then the you... And then the second one is, is almost slightly pitchy. I, I love it. I love the rawness of this. Now that the uh, almost became a, a um, became very identified with Alanis Morissette in, in later songs, but this was the first time you heard it. And so everything was like, wow, what is this? Now what she does is now the song is going to pull back. Yeah, And she's back in that very breathy, non-legato kind of place. But she's, she's kicked it up a notch, if um, I can borrow a phrase from Emeril. You seem very well. Things look peaceful. So now, there's, there's more intensity of breath. There's more energy behind it. You're hearing a little more, bit more of the bile that she's feeling. I mean, it, it, you know, look, everybody's felt betrayed by somebody or left by someone, and she so captures this so amazingly well. So let's take it back, um, let's take it back with Flea. Things look peaceful. I'm not quite as well. I thought you should know. That's, that's just so good. That is so good. And what Flea's playing there is so good. The way that she plays off his increasing energy by building it up a little bit will go on. Did you forget about me, Mr. Duplicity? I love that, Mr. Duplicity. And she uses that word, duplicity to hammer those consonants, to pop them almost like a drum fill. And, and again, she doesn't say, Mr. Duplicity. She's disconnecting, Mr. Duplicity. Now the word's duplicity, it's not duplicity, but she's cheating the language um, in order to create the desired effect. She's breaking rules, but she's breaking rules for the right reasons, for musical reasons, for emotional reasons. Uh, and in my opinion, break all the rules you want if, they, if you have a reason to do it. And here she does. I hate to bug you in the middle of dinner. And even that, bug you in the middle of dinner. Wonderful. There was a step in the face. And I know they cut that word out there, but the way she spits that word out is just remarkable. The first time I heard that, and I'm not a big fan in, in using language um, in songs just for shock value, but when she did that, I, uh, I remember hearing it and just going, wow. The way she just said it and just the seething anger, um, uh, I was absolutely captivated. I can vividly remember hearing this song back in 1995 and just going, who is this? This is remarkable. Now, she's back to the wider vowel. She's getting a little bit, bit punkier. She does a really cool rhythm thing here. She goes back, something I, I did on my, my first episode with Justin Bieber, where she's taking the 16th notes, and she's going, she's playing on the one E and uh, E, uh. That's really hard to do, to be here, 
da, 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 da. And she nails this rhythmically. I love it. Now, right there, the word is me. The word is not deny me. And usually I correct people when they sing the word like that because, because evals have certain acoustic properties that make them hard to, to sing strongly. They tend to want to flip. And so people will cheat into that, that may. But this song, I wouldn't fix it. It, it. it so totally fits. It so totally fits with the way she's feeling and the way that she wants to communicate to us that as a, as a technician, uh, I like to think I know when uh, things need to transcend technique and when you need to put vocal technique aside. And th this, this is why I love this vocal. It, it, it pushes technique to the side in service of, again, um, communicating emotion to the listener. And that's all people want from music. If you're a singer and you, you want to have a great career and you want to get people um, throwing you money at your feet, learn to communicate emotionally with them. Take them out of their every day and move them into a different emotional state and they will become fans. That's what we want from music. Uh, they've, they've, they've done test brain scans and they had people listen to instrumental music versus vocal music. And the emotional connection to vocal music was always higher than instrumental music. The human voice communicates in music in a way that no other instrument can. That's why you're never gonna have an American Idol version for guitar or piano. It's all about the singers. And this song in particular just, just really highlights uh, everything that I want to hear in a vocal performance. And that is, again, the technique that you need. And she has enough technique to get her through the song. Then the musicality, the way she changes her vowel sounds, the way that she rhythmically starts to punch some things and hit some words to match what's going on with the musicians. And then finally, this undeniable emotional state that she was in that you can hear just jumping out of the speakers. It's just an absolutely incredible performance. And that's why I love this vocal. I will see you in the next episode.